Okay, so inspiration. Okay, so, oh, I wrote the book For the Love of Many. It is a literary fiction about two Broadway chorus girls who fall in love in the man's world of show business. Um, New York City, 1924. And one of the girls goes on to become the famous actress, Joan Crawford. Okay. Uh, my inspiration was obviously Joan Crawford. Um, well, I think it's obvious. I just, uh, got a long time ago. What is it? 15 years, almost 15 years now. Uh, I first saw her, I loved old movies. So I was watching old movies. I saw her in um, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. And I don't know if either of you have seen that. I it's, haven't seen, I don't think I've seen any of Joan Crawford stuff. I am new to old movies. Um, and of course I started with with silent movies with like so funny. It and Clara and Clara Bow's stuff, obviously. Um, I've never seen any of Joan Crawford's stuff but i i know i vaguely know who she is and now i'm going to learn a lot more about her obviously but well good um i, I, I vaguely know her too I, i've yeah. heard of her name i think i've seen one thing so i don't know what that will either but i will learn more well yeah i saw i do recommend whatever happened to baby jane if you guys want to watch one of her movies. She's older in that, but it's such a good movie. And it's with Betty Davis too. Um, and it's actually the season for it now too, because it's a little, it's a thriller. So um, so yeah, she's an old Hollywood actress. Um, she was big in the 30s and 40s, but she had a long career. Uh, she was in movies forever, basically until she was, too old to walk, I guess, or too old to, you know, leave the house comfortably. Um, and I just saw her, it, it wasn't even sexual attraction. It was literally just some sort of random, weird fascination I had with her. Um, so I learned all about her life. And I found out she was bisexual and, you know, me being gay, I've had a, dated a lot of women and, have there's a lot of stories there as I'm sure both of you know and um well you might know for yourself I mean anyway maybe I've just dated all the crazy women I don't know um no I no I meant that I haven't women. dated <laughs> no. what you've never dated a woman I've never dated at all you've never dated oh, at all no. okay bless your heart and you uh, well, I'm married to a woman, um, but when, when you said that, you know, and I've of course had my own weird experiences, but uh, when, when you said that you you dated all the crazy women, like I am one of the crazy women, so like, yeah. Did we date? I don't. <laughs> we we might have. I think I might have actually made out with you once. I remember in, uh, uh, just at a at a, at a, um, at a hotel. We didn't do anything. I think we made out. Um, Did I leave my jacket there? I think you might have. I remember a jacket. I re was it a hoodie? No. Okay, never mind. I haven't made out with you then, but <laughs> I'm, I, I'm glad that I haven't taken up <laughs> one of those slots of infamy in your, in your <laughs> dating history. Oh, no, that's good. Slots of infamy. <laughs> okay. I love that. That's a great okay, line. I want some of those stories, though. Oh, do you? <laughs> you can have some of mine. Um, so anyway, so me, you know, dating women and having gone through a lot of fucking crazy, just crazy shit, wild. Uh, I was like thinking about Joan Crawford and who she was, because she was kind of a fiery woman. You know, she was very ambitious. She was very sexual. So I was thinking about her dating another woman. And I was like, what could have happened there, you know? And so me being a writer, I was in college. Uh, let me write a fucking book about it, right? So that's how it started. And, uh, and then I, you know, I learned everything about the, well, not everything. 
I learned as much as I needed to about Broadway back then, 1920s, blah, 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 Joan Crawford, the people that she knew. Um, so a lot of people in this book are were actually alive at some point. Um, and then I, I had to make up a few. So, so I think that's a good um, start. And then that's it, right? Just what inspired me. Yeah. And then setting this up. So this is right in the beginning of the book. Um, Joan Crawford used to go, that's not her real name. She, Hollywood named her that. So she was Billy before. So uh, in this book, she's Billy. That's her childhood nickname. Now it makes sense to me. It all makes sense to me now. I'm, I'm so sorry that I got so confused by that. Anyway, sorry. Well, that's probably my fault, right? As, as the writer. <laughs> Not necessarily because I, I used to have a pretty good IQ. I used to be almost 130. I, I think now I'm just a dumbass. I think that I've become really stupid. And, and I, I think probably writing my novel made me a little stupid. Like, like you said, it takes things from you and now I'm just a dumbass. So, so it's probably not your fault, honestly. Well, you're, you're the first person to say it. So, so it's probably your fault. <laughs> we love you anyway, damn it. All right. Um, okay, so she's basically dancing right now at a, in Detroit at a, just some club. It's 1924. All right, so guests were clapping and stomping along with the music. Thrilled by it all, Billy shuffled across the floor with the others, leaning right, then left, press, fingers pressing the soft buttons of their dimpled cheeks. Grabbing hands again, the girls shook out their shoulders, breasts loose beneath the fabric, hardly contained. Then they sauntered down the stairs, out toward the audience in a train, one pretty thing after another, circling the outskirts of the dance floor, right up to the front row tables. Billy laughed as she passed by, flashing suggestive eyes everywhere. One table struck her. There was a woman there, but with three suits, and she was older a wide brimmed hat covered in spring white flowers, nearly engulfing her entire head. She sat proud and alert with her pearls while the men were rather homely, rigid, cross-legged with their commanding suits, their leather shoes catching the light, looking on with such callous eyes. The pudgy one in front wore a bow tie and had, a qu and had quite a cutting stare the endless black of his eyes unmoving. It took her a second to realize all were staring back at her. Her smile doubled. She got extra close to the table to excite them, her dress swinging with her hips as she widened her eyes, turning them up, making them bigger so they couldn't be missed. They were one of her better assets, watery blue, round, and provocative. Men seemed to fall to pieces over them. Giving the table a sultry grin, she flung her dress as she turned, bearing as much of her thigh as she could for them. People of importance got the first row. It wasn't the everyday sort of person who could afford such a spot at the Oriole Terrace, however lowly she considered the place. After the dance ended, a few girls had a fit on the way back to the dressing room, cooing over some guy named Schubert. Billy wasn't about to bother with their gossip until she heard one scream. The Broadway guy, he's here? Followed by shrills nearing the peak of orgasm. Then she heard, will you cool it? He only wants what's in our panties. I hear he's absolute swine. They all are. She slowed her pace in the hall, moving off to the side of the current, surveying their faces with nimble glances. They walked lightly, 
their throats not yet crippled with the worry that covered Billy every day, worry that she wouldn't get where she was supposed to be going. Life was a wave. She was always working out her next move in the moment. The girls had been extra awful to her lately. Billy figured they'd found out she'd been busted by the cops last week, seen in a precarious position in the back seat of a motor car and then accepting money. Management had bailed her out and they better have because they were the ones encouraging that sort of behavior. Theater patrons, especially of the rich male variety, were to be well taken care of, no matter the cost. Ever since, Billy could smell the change in the air the girls afforded her. Somehow they knew. Their treatment of her wasn't much different than before, not on the surface, but it felt different. They tried to suffocate her from the start, but the shame of being fingerprinted by the police like that was a step above. The way the cops had treated her, Billy could only be grateful it was brief. She didn't know how to act around that sort of man. It didn't feel right to be flirtatious, though one officer did make a pass at her. She forgot what he'd said. She had been so distraught, but it was the typical sort. The other girls thought they were better because they only gave their boyfriends blowjobs, failing to mention they had a different boyfriend every week. They just didn't accept the money directly. The exchange was through the gifts they were showered with, the new coats, the fancy dinners. Nobody saw Billy out in any new clothes. Chorus girls made next to nothing. She wouldn't have done what she did if she wasn't so damn broke. She had to get out of there. This was a dangerous road. Detroit was unforgiving, and she could really use some forgiveness right now. If there was a man from Broadway here, Billy was going to talk to him. The end. You have a really effortless way of capturing the <laughs> lingo and the syntax and the, the flow of ideas that um that anyone living in the time probably had i i really that's really cool i that's something that i i i tried really hard to i and of course i it probably shows i i probably went too far in the direction of overcompensating you just have a really casual way of nailing 20s dialogue it's really cool oh oh thank you um that's because i watch a lot of old movies oh my god uh, thank you. You did well as well. You had a lot of slang. Uh, you used more slang than I did, but so did your girl in 2004. So it fit in my opinion, right? Thank like, you. thank you. And yeah, it's, I guess they're all, I, I, I used, I, I guess I must've done that to kind of create more contrast yeah. and kind of throw everything into re relief. So. That's what I took it as. Oh. Yeah, I, I I I like how you show her um Billy's uh thoughts about the other girls and thoughts about the whole world, and I like how yours how you have her very much alone. You know, she comes to this new environment, and then she um she comes to this new environment, and then they're like, oh, you need to stay behind the curtain, you know, because you you know you suck or whatever, and so she's like, I don't know what to do, and then so I really like how how we see her being so alone and I, you know, I'm sure they will see her grow into being a stronger and more empowered version of herself. And as she's like, she's like, also like how she's like contemplating how to get ahead and should she do it like the right way or should she do it, you know, the wrong way. <laughs> She'll sleep with all these people, women, men, everybody, or should she like do it the honest way? So I really like how you have that contrast and how you have that, 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 um, that, that ethical question of hers. In, in the book of how to get ahead, you know. I, I just wanted to comment really quick and say that I'm also glad you, you mentioned that you'd created Nadine for the book specifically. And I'm glad that you did that. I'm glad that you didn't take an alternate universe what if and have Billy get with someone like Tallulah Bankhead. Uh, and that would have been <laughs> explosive. And Ashley, I don't know if you know, but Tallulah Bankhead was also by or pan or whatever. 
And she just did not give a shit. She was, she, when, when she found someone attractive, I think she said about Gary Cooper, she's like, said, she's alleged to have said, I'm going to fuck that Gary Cooper guy. Like yeah. she didn't give a shit. And no. so I, I, Billy deserves someone really amazing. And I'm, I'm glad that she didn't just get into a conflagration of a relationship that would blow up and then not have anybody. You know, I think Tallulah tried to sleep with her in real life. I don't know if they did, but Tallulah definitely, I mean, Tallulah tried to sleep with everybody. So twas the times, man, twas the times. It was. Yeah. I had read somewhere that Joan Crawford had slept with, while she was in New York, before Hollywood, that she had slept with a prominent chorus girl or like a, an actress. So I kind of used that. So I made Nadine a, a prominent uh, Broadway girl. So I'm actually gonna ask you the same question that I asked um, Sandra earlier. Who did you have to become to write your book? I know you kind of answered it, but then um, it was kind of, it wasn't quite as clear for me what your answer was. Oh, um, yeah. So I had to, first of all, become each of the characters, uh, especially the ones who were real. Um, I had to learn everything about them. A lot of them have autobiographies, thank God. Uh, so I got, you know, their voice, their general voice and, um, you know, there's video footage of some of them as well. Um, cause they were all in the entertainment in industry. Um, but I actually, I also had to be, I thought about this. I don't know if you've read the whole book, but, um, I had to be almost like an archeologist. I think, and a psychologist and a little bit of a necromancer. So uh, the archeologist and the psychologist mainly. No, no, the necromancy is definitely, now that you mention it, yeah, like you, you do not go into this if you don't have some skill with necromancy or channeling or um, sort of some sort of dark art. That, <laughs> yeah, that, I'm a that, sorceress. Right. So. <laughs> exactly so uh no the, the archaeologist because you know I had to go into hidden places like hidden history and kind of dig out and find the treasure basically and psychologist because the the book deals a lot with trauma the novel deals a lot with uh how how people process trauma while they're trying to not only share intimacy, but also, you know, find their identity through the world and find out where they, where they belong. So I had to be a bit of a psychologist as well. I had to learn all about, you know, trauma and really sit down and, and think about the pe who the people, like basically uh, Joan and Nadine, like who were they and how would they react to the trauma that they experienced? So yeah, archeologist, psychologist and a necromancer. So basically a sorceress. I like that <laughs> answer the best. It works, it works. You are, yeah. 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 I burned incense, I lit candles, I, I chanted, I did meditations poured a, a circle of salt and gathered crystals of like different crystals. Yes. Yeah. I would show you my little dagger, but I, I lost it. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, you, at least, you know, you, you, you wrote the book while you had it, at least the dagger was there for the book and, and you didn't lose it in the oh. process of writing the book. Maybe, maybe that was part of the cost. You had to sacrifice that dagger or something. Oh, I had to sacrifice more than a dagger too. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's, it's very difficult actually. Joan Crawford was not easy to, to be honest, Joan Crawford was not easy to inhabit and she, 
because she was pretty mysterious. If you if you know anything about her, she kept a lot of her private life to herself. So, and she went through a lot of trauma as a child. So it was, it was a little emotional going in there. Not going to lie. So you felt like you became like a different version of yourself. I became multiple different versions of myself. Yes. Hmm. Yes. But I also kind of had to use my imagination for some <laughs> stuff too. Cause you know, I, I'm, I'm not Joan Crawford. So not. not even reincarnated fancy that so weird but you know i i don't doubt that she was with you in some way i don't doubt that she was feeding you information uh whether it was in the guise of your own creativity or whether it was straight up smacking you with imagery you know i uh in my own weird experiences that tends to be how it works that they people feel when you're trying to sort of draw things from their lives and, and, and they, they usually a lot of people are pretty friendly to that um I that sounds really spooky to anyone who's not us most likely but um, probably who's not a necromancer you know but you no know, Joan Crawford her reputation was ruined by her daughter so I I wouldn't be surprised if she was with me you know to try to um show her humanity a little bit you know because I think people forget that she was actually a human mm -hmm. they just they call her a monster and a slut basically so she could have been that too monster slut and human oh of course I think she was a little bit of all three you know but she was she wasn't just a bitch, you know? Like uh, she was a multifaceted human like all of us. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that's partially another drive of why I, I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Because I was pissed. I do, you know, you asked Cassandra, you asked if I get protective of her. And yes, I do. <laughs> and that's natural. Uh, you know, you you have these experiences with these people, especially people that have gone on because they can't sit down with you at a table and tell you how they feel or whatever. They, they, it happens that you download shit right into your head. So it becomes your experience. And so, yeah, naturally you're protective of her. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I said, for the love of many is true literary fiction. Even more, it's got a lovely minimalist feel. Um, back in probably 2008, my then partner urged me to capture a similar kind of minimalist flavor during my second iteration of Mary Everything. As I set out in search of that tone, she showed me minimalist classical music like Ludovico Ainotti's Divinera, which of course wove itself in with the novel in its own way, though not the way I might have intended at the time. Long story short, I never did manage to capture that minimalist vibe you used so effortlessly in For the Love of Many. So I guess my question is, was that tone captured on purpose? If it was, what art did you steep yourself in in order to, to deliver that narrative and that voice and that style? And no matter your answer, what music, film, and art did you absorb in the process of writing the story? What art lent itself to the creation of your novel? Yeah, that is a loaded question because, I mean, this novel took, it was like almost 15 years in the making, maybe like 12, 12 to 13 years in the making, but definitely like five years of working on it. Like, oh my gosh, uh, and researching as well, which takes just as much time as writing as I'm sure you two know. Um, so that's, there's so much, you know, I was reading during that time and there's so much art and music I was listening to, but I, I did pick out um, a couple of things <laughs> that I remember having a, a big effect on me. Um, but, and then I have a, actually I actually have a question for you after I'm done. Um, okay, so uh, Tolstoy, uh, Anna Karenina, that had a big impact on me. Um, uh, Anna East Nin, I freaking love her and she was a huge influence. 
Um, <laughs> uh, and Tasaki Shange, she was a playwright um, in the seven, 70s, 70s mostly, I believe. I actually have her book here. This book has changed, it's just opened my eyes to, um, she's a little experimental. So this just opened my eyes. It's a play, but it's, it's basically a long poem. Um, a lot of poetry, uh, I read a lot of poetry, um, like Sylvia Plath, Ariel, that whole collection of poetry had a huge influence on me as a writer and also um, Gertrude Stein. And then Tolstoy and Italo Calvino, he's Italian. Um, I was gonna say, you said Gertrude Stein, that's a good one because from, I, I haven't, I've wanted to try to find more Gertrude Stein stuff and I've actually not had very much luck at my book stories, but um, yeah, you you got a, a similar minimalist, um, like yeah, Gertrude Stein. I, I see that. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, oh, that's cool. Um, and Salinger too. Salinger had has had a huge influence on me, but there are loads of others, you know. But just those stuck out um, definitely to me. And then this right here. Uh, it's one of the first uh, films ever made, I believe. Hold on a second. Sometimes I can't even trust my own memory. 1915 to 1916. So it's probably not one of the first, but an early, early French black and white movie. This film... Uh, stayed with me, as well as, you know, Joan Crawford's films. Um, I love her film, Rain. That one will stay with me forever. And then I think that's it. You, oh, you said music too. I, Chopin. Oh my God, Chopin, Debussy, uh, Sati. A lot of classical music, a lot of um, jazz, not even just 1920s jazz, which I did listen a lot of, um, but uh, I was into like 70s Japanese jazz at one point because it's it's all instrumental yeah. and it's beat. So I was just like grooving and um, writing and uh I guess that's it. I don't want to go on and on forever. I could, I could, shit, I have a whole, you know, bookshelf. And so, yeah, that's basically that. Um, I had a question for you though, because I could see how that scene could be minimalism a little bit, but I don't think the, I don't think I am, I don't think the novel's minimalist. I, I think it was just the tone that you have used, maybe there is something in the way that you narrate that naturally came off to me that way. Maybe I am broadcasting that, um, but it, you, you don't, it, it's not like reading an epic fantasy or something where there's a, there's a, a shitload of description and world building. You're very much, it's very much, you, you mentioned WC, you mentioned, you know, Chopin, Foray, you know, the, these French impressionist uh, composers, it feels like that. It feels like a piano. It feels like human drama. There's a and, rhythm. Yeah, just the way it's written, just the way that it comes across the, your voice. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I, I write very flowery, I think. I well, you do, yeah. I always thought I had a too much description. Like I need, I should have 
you know, toned it down. No, but- it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Like it, 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 you, you say things in a simplistic way. You, you don't over, over flo- over flower eyes. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it, it's not too flowery. It is, right. it is beautiful. It is, it's simple and it focuses a lot on the, the human drama, the human emotions, the, the, the feelings that run underneath. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I do strive for beauty. That's kind of what I, where I go to, that's my goal line. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was I going to say? Um, oh, I never like to s- describe something twice. So I have to nail it in one sentence or I'm, I, I don't know. I just don't like to be repetitive. And I like to, I like to thread descriptive text with the movement of the scene, you know? So I'm not just gonna open up and tell you what the room looks like. Like I'm gonna open up and, and describe one thing and then she'll say something and then I'll describe something else. And it mm-hmm. kind of like forms a picture as you go along. So maybe that's what, cause with minimalism, they, they, they talk about like, like short sentences and not flowery. Oh no, I, I, I guess that there's was, uh, to do with that plot, was just... though. you're right. Like, yeah. To do with the tone and I can see that. I can see that. I'll take that as a <laughs> Um, For me, I felt like with, with your writing style, it felt like, like the, the tone is straight to the point, but the, but it's like, it's, it's in the middle between, between two, between flowery and then also minimalist. It's not, it's not live. It's not really either of them because your character is very straight, very straight to the point like you are, you know, so you don't have to worry about extra fluff or anything, you know, like we're here, let's get started, you know, you know, all those things, which I like very much because it, you know, I get a really good sense of the characters because they, it is very much like, you know, this is the world, here it is, you know, and no more, you know, just enough to really just draw you in there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't like, because because I write so flowery sometimes, I, I always just think less is more, you know? If somebody can say something in, when I have characters like ramble or if I have them repeat themselves or something, there's a reason for that. You know, it's, I don't, I don't like doing it unless it characterizes the person or it, you need that information for the later on or whatever, you know? So I try to utilize every line, I guess, really. Yeah. I use repetition for like emotional impact, you know? Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, I feel like when people are emotional, they kind of, they can get somewhat re- somewhat repetitive at times. So that's the only time I really well I try my best to cut out repetition, unless this is it's a more a more emotional thing. But it must emotion- serve an artistic. It has to serve an artistic end. In other words, right. Like that. right. Emotions can be repeated as long as they're not literally repeated and. Maybe sometimes it takes more than three words to describe how a person I don't, feels, you know? So that's, cause some, I don't know, that's a difficult, um, I don't know. It's just, I, I, I also, rhythm is important to me as well. Yeah, exactly. I think it depends on the writer's style. You know, writers have different styles, some are more, some are longer, some are more minimalist. It all depends. You know, you don't want to be like, I should be like this person, I should be like that person. You have to be like you, you know? Well, yeah. that's not exactly that's not exactly true. But you know, there are some some rules, but for the most part, at least for me, I'm like, as long as your style isn't hurting the story, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna let it be. Because your style is your voice, your style is who you are, your style is 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 um is is tied to the story that you're telling as long as it's not detracting from the story it should be unique to you you know so 
if you need to bend the little rules and do this here and not there, then that's totally fine. You know, it's, that's another thing. I think about the scene itself and what the tone is. If it's like a darker, more bleak tone, I'll, I'll try to incorporate that in how many words I'm using to describe something or the rhythm itself will be slower. You know, I even later on in the book, I even, I've got some, some lines that are structured like poetry because there's, they're meant to slow down. You know, so it's not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, I it, love it's, that. Yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> It, it it all depends. Um, it all depends on the on the artist's ear. Yes, exactly. And yeah. And I, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um. Okay. So, let me see. is in in what way is Billy more like you than Joan Crawford? Oh my gosh, this question. Um. So I tried to make Billy as close to Joan Crawford as I possibly could. Um. The only thing I could think of where she might be more like me and not her would be uh, how gay she is. I, cause I, I know Joan was bi, but I don't know, did she fall in love with women? I don't know, you know? I, and at the time, it's almost like everyone you hear about was quote unquote bi, but were they really bi? Right. Or did, was it just the cultural expectation that, you know, even, mm -hmm. even to oneself, I don't know. Right. Yeah. And, but like for, with Joan, she, would, she doesn't have to fall in love with women to be bi. If she's sexually attracted to them, then she Yeah. Obvious. No, she was bi regardless. I just made her fall in love with a woman, you know? Oh, yeah. Okay. You gave her both sides of the attraction. Got right. You. So, and I don't know if she's ever done that in real life. So we'll never know. <laughs> Unless she's got a secret love letter collection that doesn't be, it's not unearthed until, you know, 10 years from now. That would be great, man. <laughs> she she may not have those kinds of, that, that kind of attraction to a female, so she may only have the males. Right, exactly. Even though the men she was with they were rather feminine. So they're a little questionable as well. <laughs> that can happen too. <laughs> so yeah, that was the only thing I can think of where she was more like me. Um, everything else, I really, really, really tried to get into her. Mm -hmm. I tried to inhabit her, seriously, I'm a sorceress. This is this for you personally it's not even really part of the book. But why what why are you so uh interested in Joan Crawford? Why why like what why is she your spirit human? My spirit what? Human. Oh, um I don't know. There's a lot of stuff we don't understand why we're attracted to certain things. And I don't mean sexually attractive necessarily, you know? Um, like, why do I write? You know, why, why this, why that? Why do I prefer Coke over Pepsi, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't entirely know. Um, but I just went with it. It brought, literally, it brought me where I am today, right here. Isn't that crazy? That's kind of insane. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> yeah, so I can't answer that, to be honest. I mean, I could tell you why I, what I have found that I love, which would be that she was, she was very mysterious, and I like mm -hmm. to, I like to solve mysteries and find hidden things, you know, I, she was, you know, her reputation was ruined. I like to fight for the underdog, you know, like her reputation was ruined after she died. She had no chance to defend herself, you know, mm -hmm. 
that pisses me off. Um, I love that she had like a lot of life to her. She had, she just went for things. She just trusted herself, you know? Mm -hmm. I like that she was vulnerable at times. Um, I thought she was beautiful. So I think she's beautiful. So, and she's flawed. So I like that as well. She literally came from nothing and then mm -hmm. became one of the biggest movie stars in the world. That's pretty impressive to me. I had a question for both of you related to use uh, queer characters. Did you did, did either of you have any um, any apprehensions about either writing a queer character or writing any queer scenes or anything like that? Do you want to go first, or do you want me to go? You can take this one first. Oh, um, give, me, give me give me a chance to think about how the hell I'm going to answer this one. <laughs> um making people queer i had absolutely no reservations whatsoever i i went with the history so there's a lot of queer history that is hidden from us it's it's you have to go find it you know we're obviously not taught it in schools um and all we seem to know as gay people or queer people is the bad shit you know like how hard it was and but gay people have always been around and they've had fun. So I just wanted to show that. Um, I had reservations about other things, but not nothing queer. Cassandra? I think that writing my character as gay like they were was absolutely second nature. I didn't think about that, give it a second thought at all. It's so natural, but when I set out with this final iteration, I knew at the time it, it felt like queer people have made such a huge leap in such a short amount of time. Yeah. And, you know, in 2015, we were still really fighting for the right to marry. And in in literature, I knew like when I published this book, people are probably gonna nitpick me and say, well, are all the characters really gay? Like, what are the odds of that? Shouldn't you have written a straight person? And I was looking forward to saying, go fuck yourself. Um, <laughs> and I was looking forward to saying, yeah, they're all gay. And be just because you said that, I'm going to write even more gay people in the next story. Um, but yeah, so there, but no, I, I knew that my girls were all gay and it was weird that they ended up all kind of poly too. And so I ended up <laughs> going places I didn't expect to go but no I'm no <laughs> it's funny how our characters start telling us what's happening <laughs> um yeah oh my god do they ever and of course in appropriate voices like uh, I'm sure Joan speaks to you in a very matter-of-fact way and uh yeah well I wish you would speak a little louder <laughs> oh yeah I feel that hard <laughs> for me, related to like the characters, I always say like I'm more of their scribe. They're telling me the story. Like, um, so for me, they become so strong that I just, most times I just kind of listen to them because they already know what they don't, they already know what happened. They just need me to like write it down. And so like for instance, my the main character is doesn't have a name. And I can tell you honestly that I don't actually know her name because what? she won't tell me. She won't tell me. And so I actually don't. I was going to ask you about so, that. I'm like, what do I call your yes, main character? Like, you call her MC, but I generally don't know what her name is. I have no idea. She won't tell me. Oh, <laughs> so that's so cool, yeah. though. Do you, ever think, so that's, that's not do you ever think, as fiction writers, that we're just like getting messages from a bunch of dead people? And I get that feeling all the time. People in the future. Yeah. I do, because I mean, for me, it literally the the characters, you know, the the characters they already know the story. They're just telling me and telling me to arrange it for them. I mean, literally, my for mine, my start off with the voice of a character or person or whatever, and then they say, "Here's the story," 
And so people ask me, what's her name? And I'm like, I actually don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not, it's not even in my head. I, I don't know what it is. And I, I think too, uh, what I like to say uh, is that with this story, uh, with, with Mary, everything, I, it's part hope and part a sense I've gotten that I like to think that I'm just getting signals from a different universe and I'm writing that. And so I, I actually end up feeling like I make up very little of the story from whole cloth. I, I feel like I'm channeling it instead. And that's why I take so damn long to write it is, is I'm waiting for the signals. Yeah, because we, exactly. write, we write scenes and then, you know, we're happy with the scene you know we go along our days and whatnot and then we go back to it and we're like wait she would never do that and it's like where where does that come from i i don't know exactly. exactly it's like almost like a what the hell did i like sometimes i would the next day mm -hmm. like after writing all night the next day i would come to the computer and look at what i wrote and i would not remember writing some stuff Yes, and be like, how did that even get, how did that even get on the computer? I don't even yes. <laughs> yeah, and then like trying to contrive, like I want the plot to go this way or that way. And it feels sometimes like putting on wet clothes, like no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Like the, the characters yeah. are already like, no, no, it's going to go this way. And right, yeah, yeah, exactly. And my characters are like, you misunderstood somewhere. That's not what I told you. Like, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, oh my goodness. Yes, yes. I'm like, I'm just a scribe. We just it's have to figure out what they're Yeah, we just have to figure out what they're trying to say to us. And then get exactly. the hell out of the way and let them say it. Yeah. Because exactly. that's part of the challenge is when you let yourself get in the way and they're trying to get through. Yeah. And oh my God, what if writer's block is just, they're not, they're choosing not to tell you what's going on. <laughs> oh, I hate, oh God. Oh God. Uh, that's going to give me nightmares. Like I, I hate that so much. Oh my God. I'm in it right now. I'm in it. Yeah, right me too. Now. Me They're too. keeping something from me right now. I swear to God. And yeah. it's, pretty, it's been bugging me for like three, almost three months now. Holy mm -hmm. shit. I have got this big wall of nothing in front of me. It's this big plot hole. And I, I can't cross the bridge until the material, the bridge is there and the bridge will. Yeah. 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 Mm. That's wild. I've never thought of that before. Cause in the, in the first episode that I did of this round table with the other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we all, we all agreed, yeah, we channel this shit, you know, like the stories want to come through us, but I've never thought, what if we're connecting to legit entities in another world that we're just kind of like being fed this information because it, that's where it seems to come from. Yeah, like, exactly. you, Joan Crawford was real. She really hasn't been dead very long, if you think about it. Right. Uh, two of the girls in my story, Mary and Nettie, were real. They so the the girls in the story are based on people that I actually I want to say I'm just gonna say it. I met them through that yearbook. Um, I wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you who was real and who was fake, but I didn't. Yeah, uh, it's okay. Mary and Nettie are real. Uh, uh. Sadie was based on a portrait of a real girl in the same class, but her, the name Sadie and her personality emerged separately. And of course, Courtney, you're talking to her basically. Um, so. Sandra, I had a question. Okay. You mentioned, you mentioned a soul click. That's what I call it. But you say, you say that these two people saw each other and then they clicked. Have you experienced that in real life? Not so much. It was okay. I did once with a girl in high school. Uh, her name was Jen. We ended up becoming best friends for years and years and years. And then she uh, sort of stabbed me in the back. But it, the way that it happened with Courtney and Sadie is sort of more me writing my hopes, like something that I would like to see happen, sort of my own wish. So 
that was one of those things that like, you know, like her childhood, like the, I wish this would happen. This is so cool. So I'm going to give my, give it to myself in a book. You mean the soul click? That's what you asked? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, I, like how Courtney and Sadie sort of clicked. I think that's real. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I was wondering that because I'm like, because I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I wonder if she experienced that because I've experienced that, you know, when two, the two clothes, the two souls just click like a puzzle piece together. And it's actually like, well, how I experienced it was actually was like a click. And then the souls just merged. And I was like, wow, this is not, I mean, I know it happened to me, but it's other people actually experienced that. And I just wanted to ask you if you had actually experienced what you described, because it sounded like what I, what I had experienced. Yeah. And, and, and very, I, I did once that I can think of, and it was, it was, it's the most beautiful, indescribable sensation. Um, and with the way that Courtney and Sadie did it, it is kind of more like a wish list kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's happening, oh too, but sometimes it doesn't have a good ending. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it didn't work out, but it, it happened actually how you have it in the book. We saw yeah. each other and it was quick and then our merge our souls just our souls already knew each other just in a different yes. body you know and it was very much like I've, I've known you before you know yes I, yeah I've had that multiple times actually in my life only one. and it always goes well as long as the souls have their way it's when the the human ego gets in the way it's when we get in the way yes. that people become dicks and yeah. they stab us in the back or whatever so I know I had mine before I came out, so it happened then. So I wasn't able to do anything. I mean, I I could have. I wasn't brave enough to do anything until like <laughs> way later. I, until way later, but but yeah, it, it was amazing. I, I would love it again. It is You're amazing. lucky That's to great. have had it happen. That's yeah, uh, I know. that's something that not many exactly. people really experience. I think. Yes. I swear to God, I had that. First of all, I had many soul clicks, mm-hmm. like, but some, most of them were, you had to continue talking before you felt that, like, oh my God, I know this person, you know, but one time I swear it was, we looked at each other and I just knew I knew her and like, I could tell she knew me too. Yeah, it was like, both ways and then like just like eyes just eyes yes yeah it was kind of off and then the pulling the pulling like two magnets yeah I think that when it's a soul click it is overwhelming and there is no getting away from it at all like so yeah yeah but only the ego rationalizes it and you know tries to make it smaller you know Absolutely, yeah. Or I don't want to seem weird. I don't want to seem weird, so I'm not gonna, you know, call yeah. this person or whatever. No, I totally knew what it was. I just looked out at the time when I met her. <laughs> I yeah. was like, oh, it's a soul click. But thirty, okay. All right, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, so one more question for both of you. So, why are you interested? why is that the question well yeah I guess it is so what what fascinates you about the 1920s because because both of you have the 1920s featured in your books what so what what aspect of the 1920s or what aspects fascinate either of you both of you like go ahead oh no I was just gonna say um I I wasn't until I had that experience at the arc I didn't really care. It, it was okay. All the yeah, silent movies, roadsters, you know, prohibition. But when that happened to me at the archives, when I fell into those yearbooks, when I was taken hostage and I ended up in the 20s, that was when it became, it wasn't just the 20s anymore. It became my own memories. It became my own life. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's not the same anymore. For me, it's like something I remember. It's something that I was there for. So uh, it, it, it's, it's a lot like the nineties. Like I remember the nineties, but I also remember the twenties. And so I guess mm-hmm. it's, it, it feels the same to me. So that's amazing. So I was initially drawn to it. I, because of Joan Crawford, mm-hmm. but, um, 
But what I love about that time period is I feel like it's just been misrepresented throughout history. Like it's been made, you know, the jazz age and everything was, you know, sparkly Gatsby wedding invitations that you see all over Etsy. Always Gatsby. It's always always Gatsby. Like he owned the twenties. I swear to God. Yeah. Um, so there's just so much other, so many other things about it. Like people ha- were just like us in a lot of ways, you know, and, and, but they didn't talk about things. They didn't understand psychology. They didn't understand mm-hmm. trauma. So they just reenacted their trauma. You know, it was kind of a brutal time. Um, and just, but also, it's, you know, the, the feeling that we can do anything you know, it's just that, I guess that's why I love it so much. It's just kind of this, um, we're free, we're, we don't care what the norms are, we're going to do, we're going to follow our hearts, Mm -hmm. Uh, and the fact that there's so much there that I've never read before, I've never, you know, I've learned about the 20s, but I didn't know 90% of what I learned researching for this novel. Um, There was so much innocence. There there was so much unpretentious innocence. People, uh, even the weird corny humor that survives in movies and in stuff, like people, you know, they, they had an innocence that is so appealing to me personally that, you know, we lived through, and I I hope it's okay that I say this on, on camera, we lived through the age of Trump. Trump was president of our country for four years. After that, satire is dead. Nothing. We're so jaded and so burnt. Like, we can't even be afraid anymore. We can't even. But back then, everything was so innocent and alive. And there was a lot of sweetness. And and I don't know. That is so appealing to me. I love how you zero in on like the innocence of the 20s which definitely existed and I'm more like what's all the gnarly shit you know (laughs) and it was brutal in so many ways but there was this undercurrent of sweetness underneath it that makes you like hurt all the more like oh god why did they have to be treated that way it's yeah it was some of the most brutal people existed then and a lot of like women had no rights basically like they they were property um and i think actually divorce started happening in like around this time around 1923 19 something like that it was only in uh los angeles or las vegas and you had to have a lot of money to get divorced so it's like women had no rights uh they were raped beaten by their husbands and it was okay um People shot each other in the middle of the street. The the the, uh, the mob got really bad, especially 1925 onward. It burst uh, the mob. Prohibition created the mob. It turned the mob yes. from a bunch of disorganized street thugs into the criminal empire that it became. And it took decades to dismantle. Yeah, I mean, it was like, yeah, sorry. Tammany Hall, you know, like. It's still around. Yeah, and everything was just, you literally did whatever the F you wanted and you got away with it. If you were a man for the most if you part. Were a, if you were a white man, you owned the world. Yes. If you were anything they'll else. Do. They'll do, yeah. And well, I, I would, a white, well, a white straight. Exactly, there you go. And, and I think that's what I tried to convey in Mary and that's why I ended up going with a multiverse approach is so that I didn't have to deal with the things that hurt. So that I could create some place where lesbians and black people could go and not have to think about, well, there was the clan. No, there wasn't. Not in Tranquility Dawn, there wasn't. The characters in my story will never have to deal with the clan or any of the other shit. Like it's, it is, there's a lot more of the innocence there. See, mine is more, more real, like the way that, yeah. But gays, you know what I love about the 1920s too? In Harlem, gays and black people literally 
like they dance together in the same clubs, like queer culture had a big footprint in Harlem in the mostly the mid to late twenties. Mm. So that wasn't love, some, that's not something I, I knew about actually. I love that about it. No, you most people don't know. <laughs> like you literally, you have to buy the books. It, it's a little bit online. Exactly. You have to buy the books and read them. You know, and if you it, it it's because straight people write the histories. Yes. And even if if you go to any of these Facebook groups about the twenties, it's all the worst scum you can imagine. I mean, really nasty people will say things like that make anti-gay comments, anti-trans comments. And, and if you mention like, well, no, this actress was bi. No, she actually dated more women than men. Then they get all like, they clutch their pearls and, 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 and get protective. Like, well, it's not right to go into their private lives. All of a sudden they're great talking about sexual escapades and, 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 the, and the free love bit. But when, when they become gay, no, we, that, we, we shouldn't gossip about their private. We should keep that private. Why? You know, same with Joan Crawford fans. Half of them, like, know she was bi. And it's mostly because a lot of gay men like Joan Crawford. Um, so it's mostly gay men that know she was bi and they're okay with it. But the women that like her mention she's bi and they'll be like that's a rumor blah blah you're spreading lies blah 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 like they terrify me to be honest they're nasty people that uh, people that share our interest in in the 20s are some of the nastiest people i have ever met like like when it comes to gays when it comes to lgbt issues yeah like it just horrible that's just a the shame. shit you hear is just unimagined. Like, am I, am I really still hearing this in 2021? Like, really? There are a lot of younger people that, uh, well, not a lot. I shouldn't say a lot. I've, I'm following some younger old Hollywood people. So they like older shit and they're totally gay. So mm -hmm. there are yeah. some out there maybe I, not on facebook though i don't think facebook is very friendly to I, uh, yeah i guess i should i should i should clarify that usually it's the boomer age straight people who grew up with you know old movies uh you know yeah. turner turner classic movies whatever like um they are the ones that get protective quote unquote of their of, of their uh, like what yeah, they're, they're they're cinema heroes, and they they don't want them to be gay because that ruins it somehow. They they want to buy into the fantasy, the public fantasy that was around in the fifties that nobody was gay, and if you were, you were a deviant. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you think that, then just stop watching all the movies that you love because they are queer. And there you go. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, you no, think... no, 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 no. I'm gonna keep watching it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Who the hell do you think made the movies? What does it have to do with any? What is how is it relevant anyway? It's not how does it have to do with anything? At what does it have to do with the movie? What is it, the book? The anything else is, is irrelevant. And then they I mean, then they they use that same thing. They say that well, what does it have to do with anything? Why do I need to think they were gay? Why can't I just enjoy like? Why do you have a problem with them being queer? In that why, why is that ruining your your movie watching? Either? They're insecure. Yeah. They're insecure. They're projecting. Yeah. Um, all right, I actually um. Okay. Do we have to get going? Uh, uh, I actually just I do have to go. Yep, the library. Okay. Time. All right, that's cool. All right, well, thank you so much. This was so fun. This Great. This was awesome. Uh, I learned about some things I had no idea and never thought about before. So. Yeah, I learned a lot about the twenties. It sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, you two. Yes. Yep, thanks. I guess Bye. We'll another on Twitter, all right? All right, Bye. awesome. Bye. Bye. Still recording.
for me, it's never really, it's never real, it's never not there. So it's not like it's not, there's nowhere to bring it up from. It's always there. It's always, it's always there. So it's never like, there's no well to call up first. You know, it's always there. Like, like for instance, some people may say like, is like, it is, is, was this book healing or, or, or cathartic for me? And the answer is neither. Because in order to heal or have catharsis, you must have the trigger stop. So, but because for, because the trigger never has actually stopped, it's, it's impossible for me as a black person to have healed or to have any catharsis. So it is, it's neither of those things. It's just an exploration of how it feels for me as a black person, where it feels as if, as if the, the trauma will never stop, you know, and that I will die and it will stop and I will fight and, and I will die and it won't stop. I mean, we have been fighting for centuries, you know, centuries, many, many hundreds of years. And this is where we are. And we have this notion that progress has gone so far. And I ask the question, has it really? Yeah, they're, they're, they're cinema heroes and they, they don't want them to be gay because is that ruins it somehow. They, they want to buy into the fantasy, the public fantasy that was around in the 50s that nobody was gay and if you were, you were a deviant. Mm -hmm. 